Our next winner, next team, is the first place winner of the infrastructure category, Mexico City's new international airport. Ah, there it is. Submitted by Foster and Partners and FREE. At 470,000 square meters, Mexico City's new international airport will be one of the world's largest airports. Its flowing form is inspired by flight, but its primary design focus is the passenger experience. With an open air concept, travelers will be able to see the gates and where they are heading in a space full of daylight. With the ambitious sustainability and terminal design goals, BIM became crucial to making the project a reality. The sharing of the models from the early stages made it possible for all teams to access updated information, enabling a smooth transition from the concept stage to a more detailed stage of the design, as well as construction. Here to tell us more about this project is the innovative design team. We were going to show you how we made this uh, airport possible. Uh, so as I said, I'm a partner in the Applied Research and Development Group, and uh, we have been invited as a group to help the design team to, uh, to do the space frame, essentially. And, and it's, um, it's very interesting if you think the history of Fosters, because we're no stranger to airports. We have done quite a few airports throughout the years, and uh, with quite a lot of different challenges. So for Hong Kong, we had to create an entire island to put the airport on top. For the Beijing airport, we had a challenge of scale, both in terms of time and in terms of size. So we have a three kilometer airport that had to be completed in four years for conception to completion. So quite a lot of interesting challenges in terms of like creating terminals. But with Mexico, we faced the biggest challenge ever in that domain because the idea was of shifting the paradigm yet once more of what an airport is and creating something that is a continuous shell that does not distinguish between ceiling or wall or, or any sort of other structural element. So how do you do that? As Yasud said very well at the beginning, uh, when we gave this presentation this morning, the first ingredient is a fantastic team. So we had quite a lot of people working on this, not only the architects in uh, Foster and Free and our consultants in-house, but also our, our structural and MEP engineers as well as NACO as our planning engineers. And, and it's great, you start with a fantastic team and you're trying to build something extraordinary and you have to start from somewhere. So our precedent was the British Museum Great Court Roof. And that's a project that Fosters did um, almost 18 years ago. And we had to have Chris Williams from Bath University help us on that one because it has this particular intricacy. You have a topology that has to transform from a rectangular to a circular boundary in the center over a double curved surface. Now, if you think that the British Museum roof is only as big as one of the 21 funnels we have in the airport. These funnels span 170 meters. So in terms of scale, sheer scale, we're just 90 times bigger from uh, the British Museum, but in terms of complexity, we're thousands of times more complex. And we had to face all these different challenges, structural challenges, we're building on what used to be a lake, highly seismic area, we have very strict planning uh, conditions. And the idea was that we're taking all these challenges and all these constraints and we create them as inputs within our uh, generative process. But apart from that, the biggest challenge was that we needed to create something that was super continuous and very beautiful. So how do you develop this space frame where you can enter it essentially and you can pick one of the struts, and you can follow that strut up to the end of the airport without any discontinuities or seams of uh, whatsoever. So the idea was after quite a lot of uh, research that we cannot just do this in one go. We need to first start from 2D to resolve uh, the topology, and we've went from, through different permutations to define what the best topology would be for the space frame. And then we went through a big process of standardizing the sites and using mathematical equations to push every single node in the right Z location. After we've done that, we did what uh, Gaudi did with Sacrada Familia, only digitally. So we run a hanging change simulation uh, using Kangaroo to find the optimal shape of the roofing compression to have this sort of result. As you can imagine, the complexity of uh, the geometry that the ARD team was created, creating um, was really, really big. So for example, this is uh, six of the 
uh, grasshopper scripts they were doing, and only this part had more than 100 uh, C sharp scripts. So we, we exported as well the geometry to MicroStation directly with a VBA script very, very fast. This, the process took only several seconds. And we needed to do that in that way of speed because we, we were doing this kind of visualization. So we were having iterations of the design weekly, so we need to get very, very fast visualizations for the design team. So then our <laughs> big, big challenge was to get all this geometry into Revit, into the BIM, so we could use it for the models. So we, we had a, a multi-software pipeline through different softwares. We'll go very fast now through it. So the, the thing is, at the beginning, we were doing lots of um, methods, very manual methods. Like, and then we were, yeah, really struggling with it. And we had automated very, very small number of processes. So, for example, we tried to um, in, uh, generate the, all the space frame of the structure in Dynamo of the whole entire airport at the same time. So um, it didn't work because. Um, we were having memory issues with the Revit, so we continue studying. And, and then what we did was, uh, okay, we said, okay, we need to split the building in, in zones, so we divided in 20 zones with, with a grid, and then we used a method through uh, Autodesk Advanced Steel, which was working. We had a, a, a plugin, so it was converting the, the lines into structural elements, and then, uh, then were imported into Revit through a plugin. Okay, so this was working, but because we had these 20 zones and four, <laughs> four layers, we had 80 files. So at the same time, we needed like a, just a group of people just doing that all the time. So it was not feasible. Okay, so we continued studying, and then we divided the, the, the space frame into more zones. So we got these 48 zones, which were the movement joints. And then we realized this was working. For example, the, we could export all these, uh, for example, this is an image of the cladding, that, uh, the panels of the cladding that we could export in Dynamo, and then we could get the Revit model of this. But the reality is that we were staying many, many nights working late, and we said, okay, this, we, ca we have to continue developing, and we have to get automating the processes. We have to make uh, the software work better. So we started creating uh, more tools f uh, for automating more processes, so basically what we did, the first thing was create a script that was automatically dividing the databases into smaller parts. For example, the big, big database of the space frame that the IRD team produced was 600,000 lines. So we, we, yeah, we really needed to have smaller portions of it to be generated in Revit. So this is an image of the Rhino model of the different types of the panel, of the panel types. And then we had as well a different Rhino model with the different free types. This is the pattern that the, um, the panels have. So we had to combine those information. So we combined that information as well in a database. And as well, we did the same of uh, automatically dividing the databases. So uh, we could generate um, with Dynamo. And thanks to our colleague uh, Clifford Green at Foster's, we could, he, could, uh, he created the script that worked very, very, very smooth. Uh, for converting this in, in Revit. So we had the, the model of the pa different panels and the model of the different FRIT patterns. And uh, because we were having, we created these automatic processes, we had more time and then we could use our creativity to continue studying different options. So for example, we could generate in Revit all these um, different nodes with spheres that all, of all the bars. So we could use a, an adaptive component family that with the same process of uh, database, we could have the X, Y, Z coordinates of each of the, of the bars and the, and the diameter of the spheres. We could generate that, that exact <laughs> detail in all over the roof. Then we had the, here the spheres. Then we put it together, all those different parts of the space frame, and then we could, uh, something very useful for us was to use Enscape to r do real-time uh, renderings and navigations for the design team. And at the same time, we could really uh, detail much, much more some parts of the, of the roof in uh, very, very high detail. And because of we, we were able to do this Revit model, uh, we could, uh, of course, use it for coordination, but of course for documentation, creating the floor plan sections, and, of, and visualizations.
we've mentioned the scale quite often. Um, so I'm got, just going to touch a bit in on that. I just need a bit more space. Yes, there we've got the terminal. Um, the terminal building is uh, a mile long. Um, that segues nicely over to the scale of our more traditional drawing production. Um, this is the uh, office in uh, Mexico City at uh, Free Fernando Romano. Our detailed design um, drawing deliverable in three copies. But of course, we're not only designing the, the roof and the space frame and the cladding, and we're also doing all the interiors. So here you can see our beautiful check-in counter and some of the uh, information counters. Um, we've got uh, the uh, funnel lifts and escalators and the um, display monitors and security gates. Um, one big coordination issue uh, that we had, or a challenge that we had, was the, uh, the slab edges, how we um, coordinated that with the envelope and, uh, and all the other disciplines. And um, this also shows the complexity because this is only the slabs that we're showing here. Um, it's a bit busy, so you, can't, you almost can't even make out the, the 18 different segments that is uh, segmented by the structural movement joints. Um, I'm just going to run quickly through our drawing production method, uh, and I'm going to focus on our 1 to 100 detailed arrangement plans. We used 80 scope boxes for our 1 to 100 detailed arrangement plans just to uh, document the entire terminal, um, and that was using the biggest paper size we could get our hands on, Arc E. Um, we used those on different, uh, 13 different packages to document the five levels, um, only with those 80 scope boxes, and that is more than 4,000 drawings. So there was a huge potential here for automatization, uh, automation of those 4,000 drawings. Uh, just a tiny thing as the, um, the sheet extent box um, that shows where in the terminal we are in the key plan, um, we could autom uh, automize um, just by adding the lines in the title block and some uh, visualiza uh, visibility parameters, we could turn those, those on and off with, uh, with Dynamo. Another very challenging thing was uh, our um, sheet references to the adjacent sheets. Um, we had approxi approximately uh, three references per sheet on 4,000 drawings. So that was actually more than 14,000 references, and we had to automatize that, uh, that process. So we created labels in the title block um, and created a script in, uh, in Excel to uh, create all the sheet references based on our drawing numbering system that was linked to the scope boxes. Oh, actually, I promised to say hi from Mark Linton, our intern, and uh, he would really appreciate it if someone could open up the location of the view title in the API, because we used a lot of time placing those. <laughs> um, this is a Revit cutaway drawing um, that we produced. Um, it was exhibited in, um, in the Royal Academy in London. Uh, I'm quite satisfied with that drawing, and we used it a lot in our planning and coordination meetings because you can see all the uses of the airport and um, all the systems. So you could have almost any conversation using this drawing. Um, just to show the complexity of the airport there. Um, I don't know if we have time to run this one minute video. No. Um, that's the current state of the, the site at the moment. One of the final bases. Thank you.